this was the next question up yesterday. Um, use the graph to find the following, f of zero. Okay. If you recall, what we said was that the number in here is the x coordinate. And what we're going to do is go to where x equals zero and go up to the graph and see what the y coordinate is there. Well, the y coordinate is four. So that's how they get the answer four. And what that means is that this point is where x equals zero and y equals four. But this is presented more in a mapping context. That is, you don't have a formula, you don't have an equation. Um, instead, you're looking at what's really meant by this. And that is that this graph, which is the function, is taking zero up to where y is four. Okay, now we're being asked what the domain is, and I especially put this problem in so that we could study this. You can see that the graph starts at, okay, my mic is on, everything is cool right now. Um, You can see that this is asking for domain. Domain is on the x-axis. So on the x-axis, the part of the x-axis that goes with the graph starts at negative three and goes all the way to positive three. But there are open holes at the end. That, it, that means the endpoints <clears throat> are not really there, okay? The actual point x equals negative three is not there. So x doesn't equal negative three. And x doesn't equal positive three. As strange as it seems, even though x doesn't equal negative 3 and x doesn't equal positive 3, x does equal and match up with all of the points on the graph between that point and that point. So all of these little guys, little decimals and whole numbers, and integers between negative three and three do match up with the graph. It's just not x equals negative three and x equals three. So what we do when that happens is we use parentheses. Back in high school, you used open circles down here as well, so that you would have had an open circle here and an open circle here. But when you get to college, because open circles are used on the graph, we use parentheses down here. So that if, dom if interval notation were being used to describe the domain, so I'm gonna write interval notation right here, Notation just means a way of writing. OK, then the way we would write this in interval notation, which I actually prefer. Is that and what this says is that the domain runs from negative three to positive three on the X axis but does not include the actual point x equals negative three and does not include the actual point x equals three, but everything between is being used. Now over here, they're using set builder notation.
don't have time to write notation, so I'm, I'm don't have room rather or time. So I'm just going to put NOT period set builder notation. And what this does is it says this, but in its own way. For instance, it uses the letter X, which means we're talking about the domain. We're talking about the X numbers that can be used. And then a bar. And what this really says is all real numbers such that this rule is being followed. And that rule is that X is between negative three and positive three, but does not include negative three and positive three. If it did include negative three and positive three, you would have a line under here and a line under here. In that case, these would have been solid circles but they're not. So I have to erase the line under the inequality signs. Now let's go on to what are the X values such that F of X equals four? F of X is just Y, so think if, yeah, okay. If y equals 4, what is x? Well, I think we've been here before. If y equals 4, come down to the x-axis, x is 0 there. So x equals 0 is the answer. Now, we have to discuss the range. This is the lowest point. Or I should say the lowest Y value. This is the highest Y value. Range goes from lowest to highest. So we can see that the lowest Y value is two and the highest y value is six. But there are open holes. So y does not actually equal two. And y does not, excuse, excuse me, y does not actually equal, that looks like a negative three. It's not, is it? No. Um, back to the discussion of range. Y does not actually equal six. However, every little bitty fraction and whole number on the Y axis between two and six does match up with the graph. So if we were writing interval notation, we would say, okay, this range starts at two, but does not equal two, and goes all the way to six, but does not equal six. Over here, this is more explicitly talking about Y's. Notice the Y here, that says range because the range is always on the Y axis. This is all Y values or all real numbers such that 
y is between 2 and 6. If y equal 2, I'd put a dash, a, a, a horizontal line underneath the inequality sign. And if y could equal 6, I'd put a line underneath the inequality sign. But y does not equal 2 and y does not equal 6. So those lines have got to go. And that's the story of this graph right here. Are there any questions or discussion? Not for me. Okay. Okay. Then we're going to find the domain of this. This is not a polynomial. Dog, got it. It's a fraction. It's called a rational function. The word rational in math means fraction. The first five letters are ratio. A ratio is a fraction, so that's where the word comes from. There's one big rule for all fractions. It doesn't matter what number system they're in. All fractions. The denominators cannot equal zero. For anybody who's ever had chemistry, you you studied Boyle's law. Boyle's law describes pressure. It's a very important um, formula function in um, uh, steam turbines, in um, uh, nuclear plants, in coal-fired plants. Um, if there's a denominator that gets even close to zero, it means the pressure is growing beyond all bounds and there's going to be an explosion. So in real life, you can't have a denominator that equals zero. So this little guy right here, 2 over 5 minus 4x had better not have a zero on the bottom. That means 5 minus 4x cannot equal zero. Now let's solve this like we would a regular equation. 5 minus 4x equals zero. You solve it the same way. I'm going to add 4x to both sides of the equation. Negative 4x plus 4x equals zero. That leaves me with a five over here. Does not equal 4x. Then to, uh, to solve for x, to get x by itself, I divide both sides by the number in front of x. So I can safely say that if I do not want 5 minus 4x to equal 0, then x had better not equal 5 fourths. Well, what else can it equal? It can equal any number, but not 
five fourths, or there will definitely be an explosion. Maybe not on your paper, but if you worked in a nuclear plant, watch out. Run. OK, so that's why A is the answer. X can equal all the real numbers, all the numbers in the real number system, such that this rule is being uh, observed. Namely, that X is all, all real numbers, but not, not, not five-fourths. All right, and here you've got other alternatives. Look here, they're trying to trick you with this answer, C, X cannot equal zero. They're counting on you getting all mixed up with, is it X that can't equal zero, or is it the denominator that can't equal zero? Well, there is no problem with X equaling zero here. If X equals zero, you'll have five minus four, at four times zero. 4 times 0 is 0. You'll have 5 minus 0. And that's 5. There is no problem in the world with the number 2 over 5. So remember, it's the whole denominator that you have to guard against equaling 0. And that's a big deal. Now, real fast, before we go on, I want to show you what the interval notation would look like. Okay, if this is the x-axis, one of my better x-axes, it consists of all the real numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity in order. That's why we use the number line. Well, Somewhere on here is the number five fourths. That number has to be gotten rid of. There. I have a, a white marker and I'm going to pretend that we're actually taking the number five fourths out of the X axis. And then I'm going to draw a circle around it so that it's an open hole at five fourths. What that says is that X can equal any number from negative infinity to the left side of five fourths. And X can equal any number from the right side of five, five fourths to positive infinity. And so how I would write this in interval notation, let me get rid of that. Uh, how I would write this in interval notation would be to write these two intervals. Woo. Negative infinity. You always put a parenthesis around negative infinity, and you always put a parenthesis around positive infinity because exactly what number is infinity? That's why you put a parenthesis um, around it. All right, to five fourths. Now, I can't put a bracket around five fourths because that would mean X can equal five fourths. So instead I'll put a parenthesis and then a U. U means union. The other side of five fourths, all the way to positive infinity. So this is the interval notation for this answer, which is in set builder notation. This is set builder. This is interval. And let me kind of put something around that. There. Now, discussion.
OK, we go on. New topic. Applications of linear functions. An application is a word problem. It talks about how all the stuff you've been learning so far applies to real life. It applies to real life a lot. OK, I'm going to make this a little larger. Nope, can't because it runs off the edge. OK. I wonder. No, that's scroll say. All right, so this is what it says. A function a of s given by a of s equals 0 0.335 times s plus 49 can be used to estimate the average age of employees of a company in the years 1981 to 2009. Let a of s be the average age of an employee and s be the number of years since 1981. And then they give you, um, they're nice enough to give you an example of what years since 1981 actually means. It means that S equals zero stands for 1981. And S equals nine stands for 1990 because 1990 is nine years after 1981. So I'm actually going to write that out for you. 1981 is year zero, year equals zero, where it says here S is the number of years since or after 1981. 1982 would be year one. That's a little confusing. 1983 would be year two, and so on and so forth. So, here's the question. What was the average age of employees? Now, back up here. The function A of S given by this can be used to estimate the average age of employees. So that means, what was A of S? In 2003 and in 2009. Well, 2003 minus 1981, the first year. What? is going to be, well, here's an arrow, is going to be year 22. And 2009 minus 1981 is going to be year 28. So here's what that means. If we call uh, if we call this A and this B, they aren't listed that way in the problem. And notice in blue, you have you have how to give the answer. They want the nearest whole number. Okay, they don't want any decimal places. So if I want to answer quest Question A, what is the average age of employees at that company in 2003? This is how I would do it. I would write down A of S, but A of 22, because that's what year 22 is. I mean, 2003 is going to equal 0 0.335 times S, which is 22, plus 49. And B is going to be A of 28, or A at 28, the average age at 28 years after 1981. 
0 0.335 times 28 plus 49. All I have to do is pull out my calculator and we will find out. Okay, um, 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 here I go. 0 0.335 times 22 plus 49. Enter. That gives me 5637. 56.37. Of course, they already said. They don't want decimals, but my answer on the calculator is 56.37. If they only want the whole number part, that means I look over here at the first decimal place to the right of the whole number part, and I say, is that big enough to turn six to a seven? And it's not. So my answer for the answer box is going to be 56. Now, same thing. 0 0.335 parentheses 28 close parentheses plus 49. Enter. What I get is 58.38. But there's a 3 again. <clears throat> so my answer in the answer box is going to be the nearest whole number age, which actually makes sense since you're dealing with ages. 58. And that's how you do this problem. You have to pay really close attention to what, to the way they word what each part of the formula equals. Like they say, A of S can be used to estimate the average age of employees. So when they ask here in the question, the average age of employees, you know you're going to be using A of S, not S. You're not solving for S. You're using S to find out what A of S is when S is a certain number. So be sure to read stories, st word problems, story problems, very carefully and pay attention to the words. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, so why, um, how do I like say what I'm trying to say? So you used 1981. Why um, didn't you use like uh, 1990? You know what I mean? To right. like plug it's in the equation. It's because of the way the story problem is, is worded. OK, what they did is they started in 1981. So they said S equals zero is the first year. All that means is who if, if this were a real pro, you know, if this happened in real life. All that means is that their um, their accountant. Started looking in 1981. That's all it means. OK, that makes sense. <laughs> Good. Good, thank you. More questions? Okay. In other problems, you'll see other years used for year zero. It's very normal in math and in business and in science, uh, in medicine, which is really science, to um, 
change the year because calculators give more understandable answers. To a calculator, it doesn't know about years. To a calculator, this is just a number 1,981, way out to the right on the number line. You'd have to have a humongously long number line. It's much better to deal with, with numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 22, 28, easier numbers like that. And so they do it, which means we do it. Okay, anybody go diving. You deal with this if you do. I don't, I don't go diving, nah. Um, the function P of D right here, P of D, is one plus D over 33. And what that does is it gives the pressure measured in atmospheres at a depth D in the sea where D is in feet. Now, what does this say? You have to think about it. So what I do is I draw some water. I wanted it to be blue, but oh well. The sea is rough today. And how far down you go is D. And the surface of the water is P, the pressure equals zero. Well, no, it's not. It's one, actually, strange as that seems. There's George. Say hello, George. There we go. Hello. OK. So let's erase this, because what I said was not true. At the surface of the sea, D is zero. How, how deep are you in the ocean? Well, if you're right at the surface, you're not, not if you're like laying, laying there, the whole of you. OK, but if you start swimming down into the ocean, D can equal one, D can equal two, D can equal three. D is going to be however many feet you are below the ocean. Now the pressure is calculated by doing this. And you fill in D for however deep you are below the ocean. That's how much pressure you've got on you. So what they're asking is, find the pressure at 200 feet. So you're at 200 feet. D equals 200 feet. So let's scroll up. The pressure there at 200 feet is going to be one plus 200 over 33. Now, how do they want us to answer like that? Type an integer or a simplified fraction. Let's see how they came up with that. Calculator, watch what I do. One plus 200 divided by 33. Enter. So what I get is a really long run on decimal, 7.060606. Going on forever. What I'm going to do is, because they're asking for a fraction, no decimals, um, I'm going to click math. Uh, here on the calculator on the left, you've got the second key, the alpha key, and then you've got the math key on the left side. So I'm going to click on math. And frac is right there at the top, so I hit enter and enter again. 
and it's real small, a little too small to be seen, but 233 over 33 is the answer you get. So 233 over 33. Uh, George just decided to lay down on my arm. But this is the answer you get out of the calculator. Atmospheres is just a measurement like inches or feet or centimeters or millimeters or um, it's just another form of measurement, a unit of measure. OK, so everything's got its own unit of measure. Questions about this? OK. One more word problem. This function right here. Let's see if I can make that bigger. Yeah, all right. The function W of D equals 0 0.122 times D approximates the amount in centimeters of water that results from D centimeters of snow melting. All right, let's talk about what that means. You wanna read it a few times and then stop and think about what it means. Let's draw a picture. Suppose you have snow, which we did here. We had a good bit of snow. OK, well, what this is saying is. This gives the amount of water when this melts. Water. OK, because it's going to melt someday. This is the amount of water that results from D centimeters of snow. So we're going to assume there are D centimeters, where D is a number. And this is how much water it's going to melt into, W of D, which is the same thing as Y. This is the same thing as y equals 0 0.112 times d. That's all it is. Where y represents the amount of water you get here if you've got d centimeters of snow that's eventually going to melt. OK, so they give us 17 centimeters of snow. 47 centimeters of snow, and 68 centimeters of snow. And I'm just going to do one of them. How about 47 centimeters? So we're going to say that there are 47 centimeters. So D equals 47 centimeters of snow, and it's going to melt into this. And we have the formula right here. So all I have to do on my calculator is say 0 0.122 times 47. Or you could put 47 in parentheses, same thing. And I got a different answer. Why? Find the amount of water that results from snow melting from depths of 47 centimeters. 0 0.122 times D. OK. I said 0 0.122 times D for 47 centimeters. Let's try 17, 0 0.122 times 
times 17. And I'm getting completely different answers. So let me look into this and I'll let you know why tomorrow. My sense of it is something. I don't know. I don't know. I will let you know tomorrow why I'm getting a different answer. There are times when my math lab is actually wrong, so I'll let you know. Um, can I help you? Sure, anytime. Uh, you're doing 0 0.122 instead of 0 0.112. <gasps> oh, thank you. It's as simple as that. That's an educational experience. Zero point. You realize I'm going to flunk you, right? So you'll stay in my class forever. Oh, I and hope catch not. my mistakes. I appreciate you. Thank you. I need you. One, one, two. Duh. Times 47. amazing what one number can make. OK, use the right number. Write a note. Use the right number. OK, let's move on. We're going to start coming up with the equations of lines. We need lines so we can predict the future. In all seriousness, that's how economists predict the future. They take a whole bunch of different measurements of the economy, they throw them into a computer, they get a function, and then they use that function to say, well, if all of this has been true so far, then I bet next year's, we can predict next year's numbers based on the previous year's numbers. That's why economists are wrong a lot of the time. It's also why they're right a lot of the time. So we're going to do this with easier numbers and then build up to harder numbers. OK, I'm going to show you how to do this the way your book does. However, know that you can also do this with y equals m x plus b. However, we're going to use something called the point slope formula. Maybe we'll do both. And what the uh, point slope formula is, maybe this will look familiar to you. Y minus Y1 equals M, the slope, times X minus X1. Where X1, Y1 are this point right here, X1, Y1. And this formula was built just for circumstances like this. If you know the slope of a line and you know a point on the line, you can find the whole formula for the line. And now let's read the instructions of how we're supposed to answer. Simplify your answer, type your answer in slope intercept form. That's what this is, slope intercept form. Um, OK, type your answer in slope intercept form. Use integers or fractions for any numbers in the expression. OK, so no decimals. So we've got 9 and 96. Let me make more room here. All right, M is 9, 
not, not 96, 9 and 6. M is 9. And the X1 is 9. Y1 is 6. Let me double check. Okay. So here we go. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. So Y minus 6 equals 9 times X minus 9. First thing I'm going to do is distribute, get rid of the parentheses. 9 times X and 9 times minus 9. So Y minus 6 equals 9, X minus 9 times 9, which is 81. Then I add 6 to both sides. Negative 6 plus 6 is 0. So I'm left with a Y. Equals 9, X uh, minus 75. So that's what I would write in the answer box. Y equals 9X minus 75. All right, just, just for fun. Let's suppose you don't remember this. Of course you will. You'll, you'll memorize it. But just in case you don't, everybody knows this. I mean, you should by now know this by heart. So Y equals, well, stop it. We know our X, we know our X, we know our Y, we know our slope. So Y, which is six, oh. Y, which is six, equals nine, X, uh, X is nine, nine times nine. Nine times nine plus B. We have to know what B is. So six mine equals 81 plus B. To solve for B, I subtract 81 from both sides of the equation. This is going to be negative 75. You can certainly use your calculator. 81 minus 81 is zero. I'm left with a B. Now I know that B is negative 75. So now I can write the formula for the line. The equation of the line is just a formula for the line. Y equals, I know that M is nine, nine X minus 75. See, you can do the problem either way. Keep that in mind. Let's do another one. This one is a little more complicated because you've got a negative slope. It's not that hard. Good grief. Yeah, all right, so let's not jump. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1 where this is m this is x1 this is y1 so y minus y1 equals negative 2 times x minus 6. i'm going to distribute the negative 2 that'll give me negative 2x. Now beware, negative times negative is positive. This is going to be plus 12. 
and we've got y minus 9 over here. Now, I could have made that smaller and keep everything on the same line. Plus 9. Plus 9. So this is 0. y plus 0 is y equals negative 2x plus 12 plus 9 is going to be plus 21. Yep. Scanning back through, making sure I really did use the right numbers. Just shout on out if you've got a question. Now, this, this is what lets you know you know your stuff. There. Uh, use integers or fractions, which means no decimals. This is the only information we are given. There's a line that exists. It has an infinite number of points in it, like all lines do, but these are the only two points we know. Find the equation of the line. Hey, I'm tough, I can do it. You've got to use the right steps or you can't do it. Okay, step one. Find slope. Always find the slope first. Find slope, find slope, find slope. Step two. Find the equation of the line. Okay, well, we're going to do step one. Two, five, six, six. Let me write it down here. Two, five, six, six. And I'm going to let this be x1, y1, and x2, y2. For no special reason, if you want to make that x1, y1, and that x2, y2, you will get the same answer. I'm just used to going left to right. You'll find that after a while, you make rules for yourself. You may have already done it. All right, m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So we're going to have 6 minus 5 over 6 minus 2. And that's going to give us 1 over 4. So 1 fourth is the slope. Now, we're going to use the points. That was step one. Step two is use, the, use a formula to find the equation of the line in point slope form. I mean, in slope intercept form. Make sure it says that. Type your, yeah, type the answer in slope intercept form. Okay, so, don't know what I was doing there. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. 
I can use either of these points I want. Get the same answer, guaranteed. But since 2, 5 uses smaller numbers, I'll use those just because it's easier. On the other hand, you might choose to use it because it's already X1, Y1. But you don't have to. You can use the other point if it's easier. All right, so Y minus 5 equals 1 fourth times X minus two. Now, almost nobody likes working with fractions. There's a way to make the fractions go away. Put parentheses around the Y minus five. Move this over a little bit, one fourth times X minus two. And what I'm gonna do is this. There's a trick, there's a secret for getting rid of fractions, and that is multiply both sides of the equation by the denominator of the fraction. I'm gonna do that times four, which because this is a fraction, I'm going to make four into a fraction by just writing it as four over one. But over here, there aren't any fractions, so I'm just gonna write four. It is the same thing after all. The reason I do that, the reason I do this is that of when you multiply fractions, if this number and this number are exactly the same, they cancel each other out. Leaving us with one over one, which is just one. It's beautiful. Love it. On the other hand, over here, we're going to distribute four times y and four times negative five or minus five. 4y minus 20 equals 1 times x minus 2, which is x minus 2. Now I just start the process of um, solving for y. The first thing I'm going to do is add 20 to both sides. Negative 20 plus 20 is zero. So I'm left with four Y on the left. And over here, X, I've got a, a minus two and a plus 20. That will give me a plus 18. Now, all I have to do is divide by four, but I'm dealing with a line here. So remember there's an invisible one in front of X, and I'm going to make it visible through my superpower. Making ones visible. <clears throat> Everybody's got to have a superpower. That's mine. I wish I could go poof, the dishes are washed. All right, divide both sides of the equation by four in this way. Okay, now the fours over here cancel, leaving me with y equals one fourth x plus. This needs to be reduced. If you know how to do it by hand, by mind, just do it. But if you don't, put it in your calculator and math frack it. Frack the thing. I love saying that. OK, we're going to frack it. 18 divided by 4. Math. Frack. Enter. Is 9 over 2. You could also get that same answer by dividing 18 by 2. 
and four by two. Has to be the same number, of course. Nine over two. And this is what you put in the answer box. Let's see if it would be easier with y equals mx plus b. Before I go on and while I'm thinking of it, am I correct that Monday is a holiday? I think it's Martin Luther. I wait. Yeah, I think it's MLK Day. Yeah. The school is closed. If it is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, it is the school is closed. Which gives you another chance to catch up on your homework. Anyway, let me do this with y equals mx plus b. Whatever we don't do here today, we will just do on Tuesday. OK, so this is one fourth. Our X is going to be two. And our Y is five. Plus B. So we've still got that fraction. But what you can do is change two Notice here that two goes into two one time, two goes into four two times, which will give you five equals one half plus B. Subtract one half from both sides. So you'll have five minus one half over here. One half minus one half is zero. So you're left with B. So this is going to be what B is. What on earth is that going to be? Well, it's going to be four and a half. So you could work it out by hand, but the calculator can also do it for you. Five minus one half. Four point five, duh. Excuse me, I should have math fracked it. Math, frac, enter. Nine over two. So in that way you learn that B is nine over two. And so you can rewrite the formula y equals m x plus b, where you already know that the slope is one fourth. But now you know that b is nine over two. So you could do it that way also. Okay, this may be the last one we do today. There's another one, but we can wait. Yeah, we can wait. Wait till Tuesday. But let us do this. This is more difficult. We're going to use the same steps. Step one, find the slope. Step two, find the equation of the line but you're going to be subtracting negatives, so you have to be very, very careful. X1, Y1, X2, Y2. M equals Y2 minus Y1 over X2. 2 minus x1 equals negative 8, write a minus sign, then parentheses negative 4. 
See how confusing that can be. Negative six minus negative three. Don't do it in your head. Take an extra step. Negative eight plus four over negative six plus three. That's going to be negative four over negative three. Negatives cancel, a negative here and a negative here cancels. You can also say negative over negative is positive, but that's why negative over negative is positive. The negative signs cancel. You're left with four thirds. Four thirds is going to be your slope. Now I'm going to use the point slope formula because I honestly think it's easier because you have a way to get rid of fractions that way. Um, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Now it does seem to me that negative 3 and negative 4 are smaller, which makes them easier. So I'm going to do that. Y minus negative four equals four thirds times X minus negative three. Let me make sure that's right. I think it is. Okay. Y plus four equals four thirds times X plus three. Now you're free to distribute this four thirds if you want. In fact, since you're going to be multiplying four thirds times three, the threes will cancel, leaving you a four. But on the other hand, you can also do this great trick of multiplying both sides of the equation by three. So I'm going to do that. Now what that's going to do is this is going to give me three times y plus four equals three over one times four over three times x plus three. Where the threes cancel, leaving me with four over one which is four. Now here I, I have to distribute three times y, three times plus four will give me three y plus 12. Okay. So I'll have three y plus 12 equals 4x plus 12? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, fine. So, gosh, look what happens when I subtract 12 from both sides. Those zero out, leaving me with 3y. I'll have 4x, 12 minus 12 is zero. So I'll have 3y equals 4x, divide by three, divide by three. Oh, 
Let me just do this. So our answer is going to be y equals four thirds 